Still an alcoholic. <laughs> Boise. <laughs> Who would have ever guessed? <laughs> Boise. Uh, I'm Bill Seamus Patrick O'Cleveland. <laughs> Yes, I'm Italian. <laughs> that was a really weird little deal with the lady bowing here on the floor. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's an inside joke to that. There's been several of those we this weekend. You can tell that there's some people in this room that are very loved because the abuse is incredible. <laughs> I mean, we got here and we thought, well, this is Boise, it's like nowhere, you know. I mean, this is going to be a small little deal and it's a general service thing, so it's going to be really small, you know. And uh, you couldn't get this many GSR people in, a, in L.A. for anything. You know, I, I don't know how you've done it, but... Uh, the level of participation in your Alcoholics Anonymous around here is really stunning. It's really nice to see. Uh, I'd like to sober up really quick tonight because my story is probably a lot like yours, just dull and boring and incredibly repetitive. And, uh, you know, thank God there's people around that were like wheelmen for the mob or jet fighter pilots or did something, you know. I really didn't do much of anything. And... Uh, my story is, is I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy, and I rarely went to the beach, my motorcycle rarely ran, and I was afraid to fight. <laughs> but I looked really good. I had a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat, and I had a primary chain for a belt. I've got tattoos all over me. I had big black boots, greasy Levi's, chains around my boots. I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a little 22 pistol I carried in my back pocket, and if you pushed me in a corner, I'd pull my little gun on you. Yeah, I'd look really good. But like most of you, I was full of shit. You know, it's... Uh, I was a liar and a, a phony uh, most all of my life. And uh, so everywhere I was was a rude place. Um, a strange thing happened to me, too. When I was six years old, my dad did a weird thing. He got sober. And uh, he's still sober. He's 44 years sober. <laughs> He works a horrible program. You know. He still he goes to two meetings a week. He goes to the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag, which is my home group, and he goes to another meeting Thursday nights at Smaller that he's completely taken over and runs correctly. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Well, AA needs a lot of adjustment, you know. Um, but I got raised in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, Back 40-some years ago, there weren't many meetings around. This was in L.A., and what you did is you went around and you started meetings, and they took me with them. Um, you know, this, this was before the hospitals had figured out how to make money out of this, so when you went on a 12-step call, you brought them home. There was no, because it's clearly that alcoholism is a moral weakness, so they don't take you into hospitals, you know. So there were many times I'd be sitting in the living room watching television, I'd have to go in the other room when my old man brings some fat Italian guy home and sit him in the front room, pound on the book, and point his finger at him and tell him all the good stuff. Same thing we do now. Virtually nothing's changed, you know. And I'd come home from school and there'd be guys laying on the back porch. Sometimes they were drunk, sometimes they were sober, waiting for their sponsor to come home. And I'd get them up and bring them in the house, clean them up. And, and uh, there was an old boy, Harold Terrell, that became like a member of the family. And, uh, you know, we went to his wedding and then we went to his funeral. He never could get sober and he burned himself alive in his bed, drinking and smoking. And, uh, but I knew what you people looked like. I'd been to all the uh, barbecues and the roundups and the conventions and stuff like this. You know, in California, we kept going to Bakersfield. It wasn't until I got sober I realized it was a Southern California convention. I mean, there's no good reason to go to Bakersfield. You know? 
finally I figured out that's why they kept going there, you know. But it was, I knew that you weren't a bunch of old people just hanging out under bridges, hanging on to each other, not drinking, you know. I knew I'd seen all the laughter and, and I'd been to all the homes and the Christmas parties and New Year's parties. And when it was my turn to drink, I did it with a vengeance. You know, I mean, I don't recommend being raised by alcoholics. You know, I mean, when there's, when, there's, when there's two people in the house that have clear eyes and they know exactly what you're up to, it's hell. You know? It's hell. You know, Clancy was sharing last night about how horrible his life is because he got home and there were no parents around. I thought, what's he complaining about? <laughs> I mean, they were on me like stink on shit, man. It was just horrible. Horrible. You know? First time I got drunk, I was like maybe 14 years old, and I got drunk and, and caused trouble at this party that one of our friend's older brother had, and they dumped me out on the front lawn, and I crawled in the house, and I crawled down into my bedroom, and I threw up in my record player. Well, it was one of those that had a lid on them. Remember the kind of had a lid on it? You know, and it... I crawled down the hall, and I was sitting in the bathroom. I was sitting on the toilet, and I had a trash can between my legs because it was coming out both ends. And Bathroom door opens up. I look up with tears running down my eyes, and there's my mother and father standing there. My mother standing there with this aghast expression on her face, and my father standing behind her laughing hysterically. <laughs> And both of them, in their own way, were saying, Oh, my God, we've got our own in-house little alcoholic. Uh, and that's the way I drank. You know, I mean, some people crossed an invisible line. I never crossed an invisible line. You know, I drank, I drank for effect. I never, there, w there was never a time that I can recall where I sat down just to have a couple of beers and relax. I wanted to get screwed up. I wanted to get off, you know. I didn't want to just relax. I wanted to party. Remember, the whole idea was to have a party. That was the whole idea. You, everybody you hear stand up here will talk about, you. Well, then I could talk to the girls and then I could do it. The whole idea was to have a party. I ended up in my living room naked watching religious television, taking notes. <laughs> What the hell happened to the party? <laughs> the women were not lighting up coming in the door, you know. It just wasn't happening. And like any good alcoholic, you do that for five, ten years, you know. It's like you know, some people went, oh, God, it got really bad, so I straightened up. No, you got to make damn sure it's horrible, you know. Let's run it into the ground, you know. I'm a child of the 60s. I graduated from high school in 1965. You hear people talk about, I wouldn't trade my best day drunk for my worst day sober. Bullshit. 66 and 67, I wouldn't trade for anything. It was great. It was summertime all the time. The road from Los Angeles to San Francisco was the road to Nirvana. Golden Gate Park was the center of the universe. They weren't eating hitchhikers yet, so it was safe to travel. You know? We weren't cutting the acid with speed. It was just wonderful. We weren't getting loaded. We were making a political statement. We were changing the world, and if you haven't noticed, it changed. It's incredible. Every decade since has wanted to be the 60s. So I got out of high school and I became a hippie and became a biker and I, I was in, in a Bass Lake on 4th of July in 65 or 6, something like that, and the Hells Angels came riding into the valley and my life changed. I thought, yeah, that's what I want to be. I want to be an outlaw. I want to be a gangster. I want to be a biker. I want to be a hell's angel, you know. So I moved to Oregon to grow my own. <laughs> Met her, you know. And by the time I was 22 years old, I was in the Oregon State Mental Institution. I needed to rest. <laughs> I mean, climbing that career ladder is... <laughs> It's exhausting, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, 
crawling over those dead bodies and stuff, you know. Oh. And, you know, when you end up in a mental institution, it, it wasn't just like a bad week, you know. I mean, it, it takes a while to build up to that level of neurotic <laughs> behavior to end up in the mental institution. Another thing I have to remember is that the way I got into the mental institution is I called the police on myself. <laughs> uh, here, here's a good point. This is a good point. Listen up. There is a difference between alcoholics and drug addicts. And there's a lot of hot controversy and something that gets discussed in general service a lot, you know, the whole alcoholic addict thing. But there is, I am living proof that there's a difference. No self-respecting drug addict would ever call the police on himself. <laughs> but an alcoholic will do it and think it's a good idea. There is a level of lameness in the alcoholic that is difficult to describe. So I spent a couple of weeks in the mental institution and got out and then went back for a two-week follow-up program. And uh, is that, how many of you here have been in a mental institution? You other people should talk to these people. <laughs> There's something that we share. People look at you and go, God, you're in a mental institution. Only somebody that's been in there realizes it's not so bad. <laughs> you know, it's safe in there. It's better than jail, you know, generally. And uh, they give you plenty of Thorazine, so you stay mellowed out, you know. And uh, sometimes there's women there. You know, it's a good place to look for a bride. <laughs> you know. Food's decent. You get a lot of therapy, which is great, because it's all about you, you know? And, uh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, you know? We were at the International Convention waiting at a bus stop down in San Diego, and people, you look on everybody's badges, you see where people are from. Karen was with me, and somebody said that they were from Salem, Oregon, and I went, yeah, I was in the mental institution in Salem, you know? And she was there next to me. She kind of moved away from me. <laughs> The person I said that to kind of moved away a little bit too, you know? I think us mental institution people should have our own little meetings and stuff. You can be the leader. So what was going on then is I got married, I had two kids, and uh, I was sticking needles in my arm every day and uh, acting like a fool and and I lost a wife and I lost two children and uh, lost a few cars and lost some jobs and uh, I was 22 and uh, I that was a bottom I was there I could have gotten sober then there's people that get sober at 22 you know God bless you that you didn't have to do another 15 years 15 years of, of beating myself to death. But what I did do when I was up in Oregon is I came back down to Los Angeles and I got normal. And what normal is, listen up, this is... When you go out, you might need to know this. This is how you get normal. What you do, what you do is you can only drink on the weekends. The reason, the reason you can only drink on the weekends is because normal people have jobs. And this is incredible, too. They'll go, up, they'll go to work on Monday, and they will immediately follow that up with Tuesday. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And then right behind that, they'll do a Wednesday, and a Thursday, and a Friday, in a row. Now, I don't know about you, but when I drink, I don't show up no matter what. You know? You hear people talk, I've sponsored guys that actually got through college. I don't get it. You know, one guy explained to me, though, that you have to get a real easy major in order to do that, you know. But, man, I never showed up for anything. I didn't do anything when I drank. So you can't drink during the week. You can only drink on the weekends. What you do during the week is you smoke pot. And, well, you know, it's not really a drug. It's, it's like it's green and it's from God, you know, and it's like... It's just maintenance. It's maintenance. It's what you do in between getting really loaded, you know. 
And the other thing is you can't do any heroin because you can't get anybody to go along with the concept of social heroin use. <laughs> Nobody. Not even dope fiends. Will. They'll look at you, no, I don't think so, Bill. Uh, I don't think. Maybe a little speed, but none of that heroin. You, you really can't do that. So you got to quit taking acid because... Well, everybody knows why. And, you know, you got to quit all that stuff, you know, and you just drink on the weekends and smoke pot during the week. So I did that for 15 years. By the time I was 37 years old, I weighed over 300 pounds, and I was not only drinking on just weekends anymore. I was drinking all the time because I couldn't not drink. Um, I weighed over 300 pounds. Uh, I've got hepatitis C and I've got cirrhosis. Uh, I got into a political argument in a second-story bar, which was a real mistake. Yeah, but I was right. Yeah. You, you ever been right and in the hospital? You know? Whew. You know? Um, and they threw me out and I shattered my ankle and I walked with a pronounced limp. The muscles in my upper body had atrophied from just like doing nothing. <laughs> and uh, I had a pinched nerve in my right arm and my right arm was curled up against my side and I couldn't reach out to shake your hand. And I was as miserable as I ever hoped to be ever in my life ever again. I had found another wife and had two more kids. Because that's another thing, alcoholic in my variety, you cannot be alone. Um, it's a group effort getting me through life. <laughs> it requires a team. This is a team building concept. This is true today. Okay? And every once in a while you got to get the team back together and get them going in the same direction. You know? And, uh, you know, when you, you don't want to marry an alcoholic. You want to marry an untreated Al-Anon. <laughs> there's a very good reason for this. Is when the Al-Anon has a slip, she thinks about you. <laughs> then there's two people thinking about you. <laughs> Back to the team concept. <laughs> team concept. This is a quality program, total quality management. And, uh, and I found that woman, and we set up housekeeping, and I, so I was married again and had uh, two more children. And I had no emotional contact with another living human being at that point in my life. Only an alcoholic knows the truth of that, that you can be surrounded by people and have no contact. Uh, I've always been a very social person. And at that point in my life, there literally was no one left in my life. Um, I was a loud, arrogant, pompous, whiny, snivelly, maudlin, pissed off, neurotic piece of shit. <laughs> and uh, everybody had moved away from me on the Group W bench, you know. There was nobody left, you know, nobody left. And that night in 1985, and I noticed there's a lot of class of 85 around here, that was a good year. And it was also a very depressing year. And uh, that night I was with another guy and we closed the bar and uh, I started talking to him at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. One more time I was in the wrong place. I hadn't made it home. And uh, I had a wife at home that didn't care whether I was there or not. She told me a long time before that, please don't call. I'm sleeping just fine. And uh, I wasn't at home and I knew I wasn't going to make it to work. And it's like when you're sitting in the living room and you've been up all night and the paper hits the porch. You know, and you can't keep the sunlight out. You can't draw the shades dark enough. And here's going to be another day and it's going to be hell. It's going to be awful. And it's going to be sick. I had hangovers that would kill a weaker man. <laughs> you know, it was just horrible. And one more time, and I started telling this guy, I can't live like this anymore. I just can't live like this anymore. I can't do it anymore. It wasn't the worst drunk I'd ever had, you know. I mean, it was just, it was the, the last one. And there wasn't any more hip dope around or anything like that. There wasn't any more cool. It was me and the gin bottle, you know. That was it. There was no style. There was no party. We weren't going anywhere. We weren't going to do anything. We had no plans. We were just drinking. I would get drunk from the neck down. That's living hell. There's no more mental relief, no more emotional relief, but it would get rid of the physical pain that I felt every time. It never stopped doing that. I could drink and I could numb my body. 
My liver stuck out on one side. When your liver sticks out like that, what you do is you don't look down there. You know, you pretend it's not there. You know, and you just drink some more. You just drink some more, you know, because you can't not drink. I have no choice anymore. And I went home that morning and uh, I called my mother. And this was a woman by that time, that 30 years in Al-Anon. My parents never preached to me. They never sat down and had the talk. They didn't try and do an intervention. They didn't do any of that. You know, they, they just knew, you know, they just knew that. You know. And I called her and she came over very quietly, loaded me up in the car before I changed my mind and drove me to the hospital program, a hospital program in Costa Mesa. Because you see, this is my MO. I went to my first shrink when I was 13 years old because I hated my father. Well, a lot of kids hate their father. But, you know, every kid would double over in pain and the vile, bile would come up in your throat and you'd just gag and you'd sit there and just jerk and twitch and pray for his death. I hated him passionately. I heard a guy in a meeting the other day say, I don't know much about anger, but rage is an old friend. You know, I mean, that kind of passionate hatred, the kind of passionate hatred to get you up in the morning. You know, you know, let's meet the day. Let's hate him some more. You know, my mother saw this and she took me to a shrink. From the time I was 13 and I've been in mental institutions, I was in a group therapy thing for two and a half years. I've been to different shrinks. For, I've been gestalt, gestalted, rolled, primal screamed, transactional analysis. I've done it all. I, I know more about myself than is safe to know. You know? Most of it is just useless information. But the thing about it, it's my favorite subject, it's me. And I just love it. I love it. You see, I can tell you anything about me. It's easy for me to do inventories and stuff. I love the subject matter. I mean, if, if I can't come up with something really good, I'll make some shit up. I don't care, you know, it's like, you know. So I knew, because I knew AA, and I knew I couldn't just come to the lame meetings and not drink. I knew I couldn't do that. You know, I needed to be checked in. I need to get a rest so that we can do it some more. You know, you need a break. You know, I was just kind of an artistic, sensitive guy out there in this cold, cruel world, you know. And, and if you and I can get together and work on my problems, get in touch with them, flesh them out, be with them, you know, if we do that, we will determine what the root cause is and we can affect some change in you to make it a little easier for me. Well, once you understand what it is that's upsetting me, you will, of course, discontinue that behavior. Team concept. Team. So we checked me in. We went to cop care first. The guy said $25,000. I looked at him. I said, I'm not that drunk. <laughs> it's not that severe of a case. So we found one for eight grand discount price over, over in Costa Mesa. <laughs> and they checked me in there. Well, while I was in there for 35 days, they made me wear a sign around my neck that said, I am not a counselor. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. They really did. They'd have breakfast today. I'd have to wear it and pour coffee for people and stuff. There's something about humility or something. I don't know. Some, they were trying to teach me something. I don't know. Well, evidently there was some confusion about who, you know, who was running the place. You know. I mean, if you ever really wonder that there are no leaders in Alcoholics Anonymous, get involved in general service, and it'll be it's absolute proof that the inmates are running the asylum. You know, and there are no leaders. Thank God. You know, like, if I was the leader of Alcoholics Anonymous, we'd weed some of you people out. <laughs> There's no doubt. You know. So I was thinking, guys used to come down the hall, and I'd help them. They'd come to my room, and I'd help them write their inventory. You know? We'd make so I'd tell them, this is probably what they want to know. Usually, you want to get, throw in a good little homosexual experience in there, because, you know... 
even if it was, it probably was, and you just won't cop to it. But that'll make them feel like you really did it, you know? You know? The truth is about most alcoholics, they don't remember most of it. You got to make some stuff up, you know? Well, do you think you might have done that? Probably, yeah. You know? That's the truth. That's the truth. Um, I woke up with a couple of guys, but it wasn't anything serious. <laughs> My sponsor's talking tomorrow. Be sure you ask him about that. Um, so I spent 35 days in there. And uh, the place did me really good. It was a straight-ahead place. It was, they ran us up to a fifth step, and they took us to AA meetings, and, and it was pretty straight-ahead. Wasn't, there wasn't a lot of foo-foo stuff in it, and they kept me away from a drink for 35 days, and I will forever be grateful for that. Um, it worked. I had not been away from a drink or some kind of a drug in 35 days since I was 15 years old, and I was 37 then, and I was hurt. I was hurt. I was hurt physically for sure, but I was hurt emotionally and mentally. You can't stay out there that long and that hard and not be scarred and crippled, you know. I think what's happening to most of us around here in AA is that we're finally growing up because we skipped it when we were teenagers, you know. We were loaded and missed it all. I missed it all, you know. I missed it all. So I got out and I had to come to this AA thing. First meeting I went to was the gong show at the Hermosa Beach Alano Club. It was on Friday night. Rocky Hudson was the... Was the uh, Secretary of that meeting, he had Rocky's 20, 20 questions like, is the economy recovering faster than you? You know, things like that. You know? and, and it was just a big, giant hoot. And I stood in the back of that room, and I never felt so out of place in my entire life. You all were walking up to the podium, taking chip things, and saying, I'd like to thank God and my sponsor for my sobriety. And I thought... God, they should record themselves and play it back. You know, they wouldn't talk like that. My God. And then the happy birthday thing, man. The happy birthday. I thought to myself, oh, no. No, not this, not this. Linoleum floors and metal folding chairs for the rest of my natural life. No, no, I can't do this, you know, not my old man's club, not this, you know, you know, that's humiliating, I've talked to other guys that have been kind of raised in AA, or guys, people that have been raised in AA, and it's hard to admit that defeat, to come in, because they all look at you and smile, you know, all those years, they go, Pfft. you know, then you finally show up, that doesn't change anything, they look at you and they go, Pfft. You know, then they walk away because they know you can't listen to them, you know, and they try and they get their buddies to be your sponsor and shit, you know, it's, oh, you know, painful, painful to lose, you know. I heard a great definition of surrender. That's when you give up and go over to the winning side. What's so bad, you know? It's like, you know, you get your ass kicked out there. For some reason, we just can't give up, you know. We just can't give up. That would mean I'd lose, you know. But there I stood in the back of the room and listened to that, and I couldn't hear the music. I couldn't hear it. I was scared to death. I didn't belong at home, I didn't belong at work, and I sure as hell didn't belong in AA. So a couple of weeks went by, and uh, I knew I had to get one of these sponsor things. And, uh, well, they tell you all that in the hospital. You know, the hospitals are really good. They give you a list of buzzwords. You can come in and speak correctly right away, you know. And, and I knew I needed to get a sponsor thing. So I looked around for a while, and, uh, and I saw this guy, and I still can't figure out why I asked him. But I walked up to him and I said, will you be my sponsor? And he says, be at the Hermosa Beach Alano Club at 8 o'clock. Meeting starts at 8.30. Be there at 8, you know, and uh, we'll talk about it. And I thought they were just supposed to say, well, I'd love to, you know. And I thought, shit, there's going to be a test, you know. And uh, so, you know, I, I, Monday night I showed up, 8 o'clock, and he took me around the corner of the Alano Club and he asked me a couple of questions. And if there's any new people in here, I can't imagine that there would. Another thing I'd like to say, all you people that have less than 30 days that didn't stand up, neither would I, not in a room like this. <laughs> you know, I leaned over to Karen and I said, would you stand up? She said, hell no, I wouldn't even show up here. Man. You know? <laughs> Who? A GSR thing? Oh, man. 
<clears throat> of course, I guess you could stumble in by mistake. Uh, so he asked me a couple of questions. The first question he asked me is, he said, are you willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol? Well, I knew enough to say yes. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, and I suggest if there's anybody in here that's new that hasn't been asked that question, that you just say yes, because number one, you really don't know what they mean by it. And if you say no, you have to listen to them for another 10 minutes or so. It could be really painful. So I said, yeah, you bet, you and me, buddy, off into the sunset, victory over alcohol, uh-huh. You know? No doubt. <laughs> then he asked me the second question. He said, I noticed that when you identify yourself, that you call yourself an alcoholic and an addict. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I did a lot of dope, and they taught me to do that in the hospital, so what? And he said, well, I might suggest to you that if you're calling yourself an addict because you think it's a little hipper, slicker, and cooler, you might want to just drop it and be like everybody else for the first time in your life. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never had an applause for this. This is a GSR crowd. Isn't it? Okay. Now I'm all thrown off. You're supposed to get all pissed off, and that, this is when I lose like 20% of the room. It goes out slowly, you know. And uh, so I remember standing there, and I'm six foot five, and I and I had lost a little weight, so I was probably down to 290. And uh, and I'm looking down at this guy, and he's a little short guy. Well, he's not that short. He's 10 years younger than me. He's got a full head of hair, all of which pisses me off. And I could, I could feel the anger well up from my stomach and the veins in my neck start throbbing. And what was going through my head is, who the hell do you think you are? And what came out of my mouth was, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you, when you're fat, bald, and 40, and you're in your old man's club, there's no more debate. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last house on the street. This is the world's aftercare program. There's nowhere else left to go. This, this is it. When the hospitals are all done with us, when the insurance money runs out, the priest is just pooped out. When they're all done, when they're all done, they send us here to A fucking A. driving home that night thinking, because what he said, what he said to me was true. What he said. I, the last thing I wanted to be was just some garden variety, lame-ass alcoholic, you know. I mean, at least in your dope thing, it's like contemporary. It's rock and roll. And stuff, you, know? And, you know, and I'm a pretty hip guy. I'm pretty cool, you know. I'm biker dude, tattoos and stuff. I'm cool, you know, and I just have no hair, you know. But what he said to me, because I was trying to, once again, I, I just, I needed to be just a little bit different, and it really wasn't a lie or anything, you know, and I was, he took the last little bit of hip I had left. And how did he know? How did he know that about me? How do you know this stuff about me? Well, what is it? You all look with that dumb smile, you'll be saying something, you'll go, yeah, you know, and like that. How do you know? Is it because maybe we're like each other? I think there's probably a possibility in that, no matter how different you look, whether you're female or male, there's a similarity among us, about us. You know, the, the neuroses are kind of uniform, you know, and uh, I remember driving home that night thinking, this is going to be hard. <laughs> you know, this isn't, I'm not going to be able to, to fake it through this, you know. He doesn't care about me. He wouldn't have talked to me that way. He didn't, he didn't interview me. He didn't ask me any questions in order to be able to adjust his approach to me based upon my specific race. 
I mean, you're glad when in the hospital they give you that nippy test, you know, the 8,000 questions and stuff, you know, and he didn't do that. He didn't even give me the 20 questions. He didn't nothing, you know. Why would he talk to me that way? This is going to be maybe, oh, shit. <laughs> so he said, be at my house Thursday at 5 o'clock. Read the doctor's opinion, which is the chapter with the Roman numeral stuff that you never read. You know, it's like not even page one. Read that and, and make notes in the margin and stuff about what you agree with or don't agree with, and we'll discuss it. So I went home, and I did my little homework assignment, made notes in the margin. You know, and I showed up at his house at 5 o'clock. We sit in his living room, and he did not trust me that I'd read it, and he had me sit there and read it to him out loud, <laughs> which was kind of humiliating one more time. But I'm starting to get used to it by now, you know. And we went through it, and he would stop me at different places and ask me some questions. This was kind of the interview, you know. And, uh, and there's a part in the doctor's opinion there that describes four or five different kinds of alcoholics. And he said to me, we read that, and he stopped me. He goes, well, which one are you? And I said, well, I think I'm this one here. He says, well, circle it. Put a star next to it. You're in the book. <laughs> well, I kind of like that. My favorite subject. And he explained to me at that time, he said, this book is about you. It's not written to you. It's not trying to sell you anything. It's about you. And... Uh, you should identify with it. If you don't, there's a problem. And you said you spotted yourself in the book, so evidently you identify with it. That's a good thing. We read on in there, and it says, the only thing that's going to save an alcoholic of that variety is a complete psychic change. And we discussed that and determined that I could use one of those. <laughs> you know, that my perception of the world around me should never, ever be confused with reality. It, you know, the, the way I see things is just a little bit askew. You know, probably more than 10 or 20 degrees, you know. And, uh, and he explained to me that his job as my sponsor was to help bring about this psychic change, putting me in touch with this weird power greater than myself thing, and that would bring about this psychic change, that this was not about getting sober. That had already happened. That was a grace deal. It's free. You don't have to ask for it or anything. It just happens. Now what we're going to try and do is attempt to affect this psychic change that would cause me to be comfortable. Please turn it over to side B at this time. Thank you. Maybe I wouldn't go back out and drink again. That this was the key. That as my sponsor, he was going to help guide me through this process that he had been helped through by his sponsor. And he said, now we can sit here and talk about what you think your problems are. And he said... He'd be more than happy to do that so that I would not share about them in the meetings. <laughs> he explained to me that the meetings are about recovery, not about how your day was. Okay? Now, I didn't know any different. I thought all of you were doing this. I thought this is what you did. You went to class once a week. I didn't know there was an easier, softer way. I had fallen in with a bunch of right-wing death squad AA people, you know? And I didn't know that. I mean, these people do not believe that this is a program of suggestions. I asked him about that once. He says, well, we just tell that to people so not to scare the hell out of them, you know? It's like, but there's some stuff you've got to do if you want to stay around here, and that's what you and I are going to do. So I didn't know any different, so I went along with it, you know? And the doctor's opinion talks about it describes alcoholism i can remember reading that and i read it in the hospital they have you read all that stuff and this time when i read it i really started to identify with it talking about the sense of ease and comfort that comes and i can remember can you remember remember it's not the first drink it's the second and third one that causes you to breathe a little easier that you just like oh you know and these people knew about this i didn't know anybody knew about that you know he also explained to me, as we read the doctor's opinion, that this is an allergy of the body, that it's physiological. Now, they also talk about this in the hospital. And this is talked about a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous, that it's a physiological thing. I have a disease. Now, I don't know about you, but it took me a long time before I really believed that. Because what I think about myself, what I thought about myself, is I'm just a moral weakling. If I was a real man, if I had any guts, I'd act like real men act that I'm just weak. Now, you can tell me all you want, 
that this is a disease, but I don't believe it. I have no self-worth. I have no self-esteem. And some intellectual concept coming into my head is not going to change that feeling. I am not going to think my way through this program. That will never, ever happen. If you ever catch yourself sitting alone in a room thinking about yourself, get the hell out of the room. <laughs> and if you find somebody that will sit there and talk with you about it, both of you leave. <laughs> so I showed up there every week and we read another chapter in the book. Now, the first step is pretty easy. It talks about powerlessness. And by that time in my life, I knew that I was powerless. And I knew that my life was unmanageable. The simple fact that there was nobody left in my life was a clear indication of in unmanageability. Remember the party deal. What the hell happened to the party? You know, so I knew that I was powerless over alcohol. I knew I couldn't drink anymore. But I also knew that I was going to. You know, I couldn't imagine just not drinking. I was scared and I was frightened and I needed help. And it was nice. Right from the start, when I showed up in his living room and he spent time with me, I felt better. I felt better. I felt out of place in the meetings. The meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous will not keep us sober. The fellowship is something to be survived. <laughs> you people only care about yourself. You're going to hit on my girlfriend. You're going to borrow money from me and not pay it back. You won't show up to my goddamn birthday party. You'll treat me horribly on a regular basis. One time I left the Alano Club when you had misbehaved and I walked across the parking lot and I, and I was leaving. I was out the door. Enough of this shit. And I walked across and I stopped and I thought, where are you going? <laughs> it's a sad place. You know, sad place. But I felt good right away when he was sitting there talking to me, and he explained to me where I was. And the whole idea of the powerlessness, the second step talks about being restored to sanity by a powder, power greater than yourself. Now, I had trouble with God. All alcoholics have trouble with God. You know, I had some intellectual construct about, I forget, but, well, I can remember it, but we'll talk about that some other day. You'd ask me about it later, you know, it's like embarrassing. And, and, but I had trouble with God. I couldn't do the God thing. Today, I don't know that I really do the God thing, but I know one thing for damn sure. God is not an issue in AA. There's only one issue in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's powerlessness. Are you or aren't you? There are no other issues, and God certainly is not one. You don't have to believe in a goddamn thing in AA. It's one of the nice things about it. You know, it's better off that you don't. If you can hang on to not believe in anything, you'll do better. Because as soon as you believe in something, then you have a position to defend. And you can bet there's going to be some asshole who's going to take exception to it, you know? And then you'll have to stay sober at him for six months to a year. It's just God, you know? So, but God certainly is not an issue. I mean, the power greater than yourself is a logical thought progression. I'm powerless. In and of myself, I can't fix me. The next logical thought progression is I need help. And if the help can help me, it's got to be more powerful. So hang on to that. The group, your sponsor, anybody. I need help. I can't fix me. I mean, the whole idea of are you willing to go to any lengths and are you powerlessness, when the longer you're around here, powerlessness takes on a larger dimension, doesn't it? You know, because we all, we stick around here long enough, we get powerful again. You know? I've had debates with people that, well, now that you're sober, you have power. And I go, I'll watch you. <laughs> Report back. <laughs> Let me, here's my pager number. You know, I'll come and get you. You know, because I don't know about the whole power thing. I don't think I have much on almost any level. But the second step is the good news. There is hope for us. There's help. The third step says we're going to turn our life and our will over to the weird concept in the second step. <laughs> have you ever heard anybody in AA say that they're stuck on the third step? Where? <laughs> yeah, you're stuck on the third step because you don't want to do the fourth and fifth. And the reason, the reason you don't want to do the fourth and fifth step is because you are never, ever going to pay back the money. <laughs> I 
I mean, four or five is close, closer to nine. You need to stay away from it. And what I believe about the third step today is, because I skipped it, <laughs> you know, is, you know, the life and will it's talking about is the fourth step. That's the life and will. It's the resentments, four columns, not three. The resentment, why you're resentful, how it affected you, and the fourth one, you have to turn the page, they couldn't fit it on there, and people argue with you that there's really a fourth and all that shit. It's your part in it. What's your part? We got it down on paper. What's your part? It's a four-column resentment list. It's a fear list that may or may not have anything to do with the resentments. Generally, it does. You cannot be an alcoholic without a good, long, healthy resentment list and a good, long fear list. Generally, pissed off at everybody and scared to death of all of them, too. You know? you got to do that. Guys come to me and they don't have a long one. I go, you're not an alcoholic. God bless you. See you later. Come back when you get some good resentment, you know? Then there's the sex list. It's the sheet stories, you know? Everybody has one. I mean, it may not have actually been a sheet, but being here in Idaho, it probably was. What was that, Alan? I was just helping the pig over the fence. List. It says, where, 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 have, well, you can have them. I mean, it says, you know, where have I been selfish and self-centered? Where have I instilled jealousy in others? It's a relationship. It's a broken relationship list is what it is. That's the life and will that it's talked about in the third step. The fifth step is the physical and literal turning it over. When people walk up to you in AA and they say, well, just turn it over. Slap them. They don't get it. You know, this, this is not some ethereal thing. You know, so like, turn it over like you can. You know, I mean, it's like, well, you just have to relax and kind of go with the flow. Yeah, bullshit. You know, you got to do something with it. You have to write it down and then give it to someone. You have to identify what it is. The life and will that you can't do a third step without four and five. You've probably figured out I have opinions. <laughs> You know, you hear people in AA say, you know, the longer I'm sober, the less I know. That hasn't happened to me yet. You know? The people that say that, I don't trust them. You know, I mean, it's like, I've been around here for a little while. I think I know something about this. I think I know the right way to do it. Until I'm proven wrong, I'm just going to hang right in there. I hear somebody stand up here. I want to hear what you think about This is by far the most interesting thing that's ever happened to me in my life. This is not a pastime. It's where I live, and I, I think I know the house I live in. I look around, I see things, I form opinions, I'm a human being. I think I have some ideas about it. I don't have very many variations on the theme. It seems all pretty clear to me. There's only one path. We would love that you hear people say stuff like, well, there's a different program for every person in AA. I don't believe that. I just think we'd like it to be that way. You know, we don't want to be a sheep, you know. We want to be the, one of the wolves out there or something, you know. We're a little bit different or something, you know. I mean, it's like the alcoholic addict thing. I need to be sort of special, you know. My case number has an A next to it, you know. It's like, you know, you've got to treat Bill a little. We need, to, we need to kind of adjust the program a little bit for Bill, you know. I don't think that's how it is. I think it might be delivered in different ways, but there is only one program. The fifth step, when I did my fifth step with the sponsor, he says, you're a member now. I said, what do you mean? I wasn't before. He goes, no. I said, well, I thought the only requirement. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, you know, remember I told you before you've got to do some stuff? You've done it. You're in now. Most people don't do an inventory. What I believe about that today, people that tell you they've done an inventory, I'm suspicious of it. Some of them have written down maybe a little life story. They've had the kind of sponsor that said, well, do your inventory, come back and tell it to me later. You know, that kind of thing. And they've done that. I've got, I get guys now that are sober nine, ten years that finally want to do it. That there's something going on around here that I'm not getting. Seems like maybe you've got it. Would you help me? And these are people, they're not, their life isn't in jeopardy. They have good jobs they, and they're just absolutely miserable. They're scared to death. They don't feel part of and they don't know why. And I think they've never cleaned house. And they've never for damn sure have not made the amends. They've mumbled a few things, maybe. 
The sixth and seventh step, he actually went around to people and he said, you can talk to him now, he's okay. You know? So I, I humiliate people like that now, you know? It's like, you're in now, you're in. The sixth and seventh step is two paragraphs in the book. You say the prayer, it's over. People say, I'm stuck on the sixth step. Once again, where? Where? Where are you? Now you're empowered now, right? Now, now that I've done my fifth step, I'm empowered. So I'm going to line my character defects along a wall. I go, this week I think I'll work on gluttony. You know? Maybe that's what I... It hasn't worked that way for me. If you want to confront your character defects, make the amends. You'll run into every single one of them in stark, bright, living color. There they all are. It's all in your inventory. From the inventory, you do an eighth step that lists all the people that you've injured, monetarily or emotionally, or both. And you go about the process in the ninth step, which is where the psychic change that occurs that's talked about in the doctor's opinion. When you take an alcoholic like me, the last thing, the last person he wants to see is you. I would just as soon forget that it ever happened, that I ever attacked that woman. I don't want to think about it. It's in the past, and I don't want to make any ways. I, I'm just, let's get on with my life. When I go meet that person that I never, ever want to see again, and I look them right in the eye, and I say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. When I return from that experience, I cannot stay the same. I will inexorably change. I can't stay the same. Change is action. Willingness without action is fantasy. Nothing happens. Sitting in my living room, learning how to love myself till I love you is an act of futility and total bullshit. <laughs> you want to make amends to yourself? Put yourself on the bottom of the amends list. By the time you get there, you'll have some self-esteem. That's what I believe. That's what has happened to me. I've got to take action. I have to move my ass. I can't just sit around. People that don't do this don't get 80% of the program. 80%. The tenth step is about me making amends to you when I've injured you in sobriety. And if you look at the tenth step is described in the eleventh step. That's where the tenth step is described. I think they're stuck together. I don't think you can really do one without the other. If you want to get close to God, get close to people. You can go meditate on a mountain, which is a good thing to do. It's a good thing to be quiet and spend some time meditating. I believe God lives in the space between you and I. And the closer I am to you, the closer I am to God. I learn nothing by myself. You teach me everything. My very life depends my, on my constant thought of you and how I may help meet your needs. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of my problems. I had no idea how self-centered I was until I was three years sober. I had no idea. The eye can't see itself. I don't know that I'm that self-centered because I know nothing else but me. I'm my only experience. I need you to show me that. The eleventh step is the great journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the journey of getting closer to whatever it is that has saved our lives. Because my life has been saved. I don't know about you. I didn't just walk in here one day thinking this would be a good program to improve myself. <laughs> this is not a self-help program. This is not a support group. That isn't what this place is. Some of the stuff that comes into it would lead you to believe that. There's concepts. I think that once I grasp the concept, I'll be better. I don't think that's true. Action is the only thing that's made me better. Action, making amends, getting in your face and then coming back the next day and saying, I'm sorry. The reason I don't say no to an AA request, and I don't think you should either, is you're not qualified to determine what's good for you. <laughs> I believe I'm like you. We talked about that earlier. If we're like each other, then what's good for me is probably good for you. Have you heard people say in AA, well, I don't do that. That's for others. Whoa, my God. You're empowered, I see. You can decide. I, if I can't do that. I don't know about that. I don't know what's good for me. I think I should do it all and then weed out the other stuff later. Have you ever heard somebody say, I don't sponsor people? How can you say that? Aren't you afraid lightning will strike you? 
I had the experience recently a couple of times in the last few weeks where somebody who was desperately in trouble came to me and said, I've asked several people to sponsor me and they say they don't have the time. And I told them, give me their names, I'll have them shot. <laughs> you don't have the time? Where the hell do you think you are? What do you think this is? This isn't church. Recovery really happens here. People's lives really get saved here. We are blessed with, with the, the, the position to be in a place where people's lives are saved every day. Every day. Some, and you know how they get saved? Me. You. That's who does it. It, is the, it isn't the room. It isn't the Alano Club. It isn't the goddamn meeting. It isn't the wonderful speaker. It's you sitting in the living room with the person, having the patience to be with them. You want to learn tolerance and patience? Sponsor people. <laughs> the little bastard will come in. You don't like him. He stinks. He stinks. He's stupid. He can't read. He's crippled. He's ugly. He's a cowboy. <laughs> or a surfer. say no. My sponsor told me when I was six months sober, he says, get your name on the 12-step list down at the uh, central office. You can't be a member of AA unless you're on the 12-step list. Shit. I said, maybe that's where they issue the ID cards. <laughs> I ran down there and signed up. And I thought, I don't want to get kicked out now. It's the only place that ever let me in. <laughs> but I can't say no. You know how I learned that? Because I watched my sponsor say no to a guy. He said, no, I don't have the time. And he went up and talked to his sponsor. His sponsor slapped him around a little. And he came back and he was talking to me. I happened to come over to his house one day and he had tears in his eyes. He said, I've got to go find Kevin and tell him and apologize to him for saying that. And he went and found him and apologized to him. And I was impressed. You know, whenever I've seen people tell the truth around here or really come to terms with things, I think these guys are serious about this. You know, it's like Clancy talked about last night. Living right. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing which many, many times is not what I want to do. Now, the Al-Anon speaker talked about being honest with the IRS. I don't particularly like hearing stuff like that. <laughs> I think that's an outside issue. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> Now, what do you suppose I'm going to be thinking about all the way back on the airplane? But it's about doing the right thing. It's about being there for the people. Because there's people coming in here that are waiting for you. They need you, not me. They need you. I was standing outside the Alano Club one night, a couple years sober, and this wino had been hanging around the club. And uh, he came walking up and he was drunk, and my sponsor was standing there and another guy, Tony. And uh, my sponsor said to him, if I find you a bed somewhere, will you go? And he goes, well, yeah, sure, okay, you know. So he goes back, he makes a couple of phone calls, the wino kind of walked away. I said to this guy, Tony, that was standing there, I go, what are we wasting our time with this guy for, man? He doesn't want to get sober. And this guy, Tony, turned on me, he goes, who the hell are you? I went, whoa, what do you mean? He goes, that's what I look like when I got here. A guy like that can't come here, where the hell can he go? Where do you think you are, kid? You know, jeez. Sponsor comes back and he says, tells the wino, he says, I got you a bed. He looks at me and he says, go get your car. <laughs> Well, he told me the reason I was sent to AA is that you all needed better transportation. I had a car. You know? I drove the AA assault vehicle for a lot of years. You know? We go get them, man. We don't talk to them on the phone. We go get them. You know why you go get them? You get up real close to them, look them in the eye and smell the booze and tell me if you can't see the demon running around in their eyes. The demon lives. It's real. It's not a fantasy. It's real. You know that. But you forget it, don't you? Life gets good. You go look at them. You can see the demon. You can see it. We exercise demons around here. We save lives, literally. We save, we do it. We are the instrument that God uses to save these people. It's a job. It's a pleasure. It's a gift. It's a talent. All of us need messages with depth and weight. It says after the, next, after the ninth step, our next function is to increase in effectiveness. What do you suppose Wilson was talking about? Wilson said every sponsor is a leader. 
There's some people around that will tell you that, well, that's an ego trip, man. You're placing yourself above people. Teachers need students. If there's no student, there can't be a teacher. The student needs a teacher. If there's no teacher, there can't be a student. It's not above or below. It's a symbiotic thing. We need each other. I'm the teacher. I'm not a newcomer anymore. I know something about this, and I can give it to you, and it's my duty and my privilege to do that. Never, ever, ever say no under any circumstances for any reason. It's our work. It's why we were saved. So I went and got the car, and I came drove, driving up. They opened the back door of the car and threw his bedroll in, opened the front door and put him in. No one else got in the car. I don't think that's legal. I think if you look that up in the service manual, it says that someone else has to go. So they told me, drive him to the way back in, don't stop for anything. So I'm driving, and I think this guy's going to stab me and eat me. You know, I mean, it's like, how, how, well, I would have no idea. I would never think that maybe he was frightened. You know, I'm too wrapped up in myself. He starts talking to me, and he tells me, he says, you know, what happened in my life? I was married, I had a couple of kids. Uh, what happened? And I looked over at him, and I realized he probably wasn't much older than me, maybe younger. He just looked really bad. And he started crying, and he was scared, and he was shaking. By the time I got to the way back in, I was holding his hand. This is my own personal alcoholic. You know, I fell in love with the guy. I became him. I realized, and I said a prayer after I dropped him off. It wasn't a prayer of, thank God it's not me. Thank you, God, for letting me see that it is me. That is me. He is me. You know, and I became one with him at that moment. I realized that, you know. And I've never looked up or down at one ever again. You know, they're me. You're me. You may be younger, you may be older, male or female, but we're all the same. You see, I'm an AA evangelist. I believe it all. We're not supposed to preach. I preach. You get me on a 12-step call, you got trouble. You know? <laughs> me and this guy, Chris, went on a 12-step call, and we're driving down the street trying to find the house. And you can see the house. You can always pick it out. You know, green, 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 brown. You know? There he was. There he was. We walked in the house, and he was sitting on the couch in his underpants, crying. This man had been sober six or seven years, and had gone out, and he'd been drinking for four or five years. She left him, and he was devastated, and he was sick, and he was shaking real bad. And we were sitting in the living room with him, and he says, you know, I don't know what happened. You know, she left me, and I, I did the best I could. And I, I watch religious television all the time, and God has forsaken me. God has forsaken me. And I looked at him, and I said, no, he hasn't. He sent you us. <laughs> and that stopped him. And he looked at me, he stood there and looked at me, and I didn't know, I have a clue what to say next, you know. And I reached my hand out and I said, take my hand, I'll save your life. So he took my hand. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking real fast, and my buddy Chris is over there going, God, you can't say that! You just can't! You can't say that! You know? And he got up to leave and he realized I had driven. So I looked at the guy and I said, do you have any alcohol in the house? He said, yeah, yeah, I do. And I said, well, let's go pour it out because you don't drink anymore. And we went into the kitchen and he poured out like a half a gallon of Kessler. And he handed it to me and I said, no, you got to do it. And he poured that out and he cried, man. He cried. And I, we did too. It was just, <laughs> there was just something wrong with that, you know. You should, like, give it away to the next door name. The other brown lawn, you know. Find the other guy with the brown lawn. And, you know. So we took him down to the to an Alano club and sat there with him, and, and I had to help him get dressed. This was a grown man. He was as big as me. Uh, probably at one time he was quite athletic and, and uh, an intelligent guy, educated guy, and he couldn't zip up his own pants. And it's, that's sad, you know. And I had, I had to help him get dressed to get out of the house. 
And we took him down to the Alano Club and dropped him off. And a couple of years later, uh, the guy that was with me uh, spoke there and he told that story. And the guy that led the meeting told us that that, that man died. And he just couldn't hang. He just couldn't stay. There's two kinds of people in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's those who work the steps and those who don't. Those who don't work the steps think that there's a click. And they're right. It's those who work the steps. That's the click in Alcoholics Anonymous. We all stay very close together. When you come, when you're new, when you come into the meetings, it looks like we all go home together. You know? But we're just staying close together. We can stay close together and watch the passing parade. Watch people come in. Don't miss the experience of sitting across the table from another alcoholic and see the light come on in his eyes. Don't miss that for whatever your excuses are. If you don't think that you don't speak that well, if you don't think that you interact with people that well, you don't have that much to offer, whatever it is that stands in the way of you working with another alcoholic one-on-one, -on -one, which is the heart and soul of Alcoholics Anonymous, it comes straight from the Oxford group. It's what Bill and Bob learned from those people, that that's how you do it. That's how you do the soul surgery, through your own example. You take them by the hand and you take them into Alcoholics Anonymous. You do it with them. Don't miss the experience. The light that comes on in their eyes is hope when they realize, just like all of us have, hey, this is going to work for me. The people that don't do this work in AA, if they stay sober or not, miss 80% of the program. The steps are 20%. It is preparing us for the work. If you have a sponsor that's not guiding you through the steps, through the process of AA, and teaching you and showing you how to sponsor others and work with others, maybe you have a good friend. Maybe you have a father figure. Maybe you have a brother that you lost one time. But just maybe you don't have a sponsor. Don't miss the experience. It's 80%. Those people need you they need you. They want you. They must have you. Don't miss it. Thank you.